Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Today we're gonna to have Mirtul Manawaki tell us about uh, optimal polynomial approximants, something that's near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm excited uh, that everybody else can hear about this. Um, thanks Mirtul. Okay, Enjoy. thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's great to be considered a young researcher. Uh, I don't know, maybe you, you invite old researchers to talk about you, the young people, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but in any case, so my talk today will be uh, an introduction to optimal polynomial approximants in the point of view of my own research uh, stream. Uh, this is based on, on joint work with uh, Catherine Benetto, Legivri, and Daniel Seco. But I would like to start my journey uh, with my... Uh, with something else. I would like to start my journey. I hope I can, uh, it's for some reason, as I said, I'm the queen of uh, disaster uh, in technology. Okay, all right, it works. Okay, so I can change my uh, slides and I will start my journey by my guilty research past. So how I started in my PhD uh, before I start talking about optimal approximants. And this is somehow related to the talk today. So when I was young, I studied the concept of universality, which is the concept that you have one object, one mathematical object, usually a function. You have a countable process. So thinking about this, like taking approximants, like Taylor approximants, and what you do, you approximate a whole universe of objects. So let's put it in a more mathematical framework. So let's say we have two topological vector spaces, X and Y, and we have a sequence of maps. Uh, Tn. Uh, so we will say that a vector x in the first space, uh, it's going to be a universal vector for my sequence of uh, mappings. If I consider the orbits Tn of x uh, for all possible n, and these orbits are dense in my second space y. So here I have uh, illustrated this by my own uh, journey as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, so you see, I, I was born here in Greece, and then I went. So the dates correspond to the, uh, you know, to the to, to the where where I got the position. Here we see Florida, Canada. Anyway, the postdocs basically are universal vectors. They go around the world until they stabilize. Uh, however, of course. Uh, I'll have to give you some uh, more concrete uh, examples. Um, and I will start with the notion of hypercyclicity. Uh, so hypercyclicity is just the simple case where my two vector space are the same and my TN operator are just the nth iterate of a fixed uh, operator T. So when we have a universal vector, uh, in this concept, we say it's a hypercyclic vector. So this is a rapidly developing area, a research area, and it also connects with chaotic dynamical systems. I have a mathematical friend, Cliff, Cliff Gilmore, who works on this uh, subject. So he managed to, in his PhD, among other things that he proved, he managed to capture the definition of uh, chaotic dynamical system in this diagram with a bicycle. So he, he, he's a fanatical cyclist, but also hyper cyclist. So he combined these two in a beautiful way. I can explain you later if you wish the, the, the definition of cows. But anyway, hypercyclicity is an, a broad area, but I don't, to be honest, I don't work in hypercyclicity. Uh, I would like to give you some more examples of universality. I will go back now to a very classical example, which is due to Birchhoff. Uh, it's almost uh, 90 years old, this example. So here, my space X will be the space of entire functions in the complex plane. And my space Y, it's going to be the same space. So what will be now my TN operator? My TN operator will map a function which is entire to its shift uh, F plus N. So you shift um, by N. So in, in this formulation, Birchhoff, of course, didn't speak the language of universality. He had this uh, result that says that for any entire function um, in the complex plane, I can find the subsequence of, of natural numbers. Uh, so first of all, sorry, I can find an entire function f, which is independent of anything, which has this magical property that for any other entire function, I can find the subsequence 
of natural numbers, nk, with the property that f of z plus nk approximates uh, my function, my other function. And this is uniform approximation on compact sets in C. So this concept is exactly, he proved that there is a universal vector uh, with respect to this, uh, what I wrote before. So there are many uh, partial results. Uh, later, MacLean proved an analogous result about the derivatives uh, of entire functions. I'm not gonna list them all, but I would like to point out something quite important that although universal vectors not only exist, but when they exist, there are many. So how do we measure the many? We measure it in a topological sense. So they form a Z-delta dense uh, subset, as we will see later. However, there was no explicit example of a universal uh, object. We did, I mean, we could prove maybe sometimes with some constructive methods, but you don't really know um, a formula for the functions. There is only one universal object which is, which is known that has a precise formula, and this is the Riemann zeta function. And I find this quite uh, astonishing. So the Riemann zeta function, as you probably know, it is defined as a Dirichlet series. So it's the Dirichlet series of one over n to the power of s. So it's a function of s, and it is defined on the right half plane. And we can also extend this formula by analytic continuation to a meromorphic function on the whole complex plane. So the big question uh, is the Riemann uh, hypothesis. I hope you know what is the Riemann hypothesis. Well, the Riemann hypothesis asks us to, to locate the zeros, the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And the assumption is that they all uh, they all belong in the critical uh, line, real part equals a half. So they all belong here. Uh, so here, th they also call it a, a critical strip is uh, the strip where the real part is between a half and one, because we know that the zeros, the non-trivial zeros belong there in this closed strip. So it remains to show that they belong in this, uh, where real part uh, is one half. So let's see now how this relates to the concept of universality. So we have this concept of um, this, this theorem due to Voronin, quite recent, uh, let's say, that it tells you the following. So you take your, your strip, so this critical strip, let's call it S, uh, and you will have the property that any zero free, so any zero free holomorphic function on this critical strip and any compact set K inside the strip with connected complement, we don't want to have holes, I can find the subsequence of real numbers tending to infinity such that my Riemann zeta function estimated at Z plus I T K converges to F of Z. And this converges is uniform on K. So when I put something here on K, I put my, my F. Again, my F is zero free. So what I can, I can do, I can approximate by the Riemann zeta function if I uh, make um, vertical shifts this time. So it's like Voronin universal, sorry, it's like Birkhoff, but the difference is that now you, um, you shift vertically. Uh, okay, there is a very important thing here that my function is assumed to be zero free. And one of the reasons why I included this result is because what we are doing in some sense relates to zero free approximation. So what is important here uh, is that if we manage to remove the zero free hypothesis, so if, if the theorem becomes like that without the zero free, then the Riemann hypothesis fails. I have put here some dollars, but in case you go and try to disprove it, you don't get any dollars. It's just, uh, if you prove it, you get the dollars. If you don't prove it, you just get the fame, but you can maybe use it to get the dollars. Um, okay, so why this fails? Uh, which theorem is behind? Is Hurovitz theorem. Because what do we know in complex analysis? If I have a sequence of functions, 
uh, which converge uniformly uh, to a function and they are analytic, they are holomorphic. Um, if they are, um, so what we will do, we'll select a point here, uh, let's say in the interior, Z naught. So I'm going to approximate the function Z minus Z naught. This is uh, holomorphic everywhere. It's not zero free. So if the limiting function has a zero, then also the approximants, which are holomorphic and converge uniformly, according to Hurwitz theory, will have also to have this zero. So in other words, my approximants, which are the Riemann zeta function, will have to have a zero somewhere in the interior part of the strip. So this would disprove uh, the Riemann hypothesis because the Riemann hypothesis says that all zeros uh, live uh, not in the interior of the strip, but where the real part is a half. Anyway, uh, this is again, uh, I always put Voronin when, uh, you know, when you give an interview, it's good to say that my research will prove or disprove the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, but there is an, a, a deeper reason why I put it this time. Because as I said, what we will see about the optimal polynomial approximants, in the end, it will relate to zero free approximation. So what I want to keep uh, from this slide uh, is that removing the zero free hypothesis or adding it, it's not a trivial thing. It's a completely different problem. Uh, and let's see a, a last example before we focus on our things. Uh, this is actually the example that I spent most of my research uh, life, is the example of universal Taylor series. So here we have the unit disk uh, in the complex plane. So my, my space X will be the space of holomorphic function on the unit disk. Uh, the TN will be just the nth partial sum of the Taylor series of a function holomorphic. Uh, and Y, the space where we want to do the approximations, will be just the space of continuous functions on a fixed set E and holomorphic on the interior. So E, it will be always a compact set outside my uh, disk. Uh, and it will have to have no holes so that we have hope to be able to approximate things. Uh, so such universal vectors are called universal Taylor series. So philosophically, if you see that, their Taylor expansion converts to a single function inside the disk. They converge to F. And outside, on let's say on a fixed set E, they converge everywhere you like. Basically, this space Y is the, the, the biggest space you could uh, imagine for, for doing uniform approximation of polynomials. Uh, so there is this type of stark dichotomy. So inside the disk, you converge to a single function. Outside the disk, you converge to everything you like. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, notation U of E for this class. It's not really important. But what I would like you to keep uh, which what I'm gonna write is not very precise and correct, but uh, roughly speaking, if E is large, so F, F a universal function on E has wild, wild, has wild boundary behavior. Uh, in which sense? Uh, so for example, if you are able to approximate everything outside the disk, so E could be anything you like, um, you can still um, provide such examples of universal functions that, that yield approximations everywhere outside the disk. Uh, so in that case, uh, a universal function has uh, two properties. So on, on one hand, uh, on its triangle with vertex at the unit circle, uh, the image of F of this triangle, it's a dense set in the complex plane. And this happens for almost every vertex, Z. So already this is a wild boundary behavior result. So when I approximate in, in a storage angle or, or an, on a triangle, I get everything. And this was due to Gardiner, uh, this result from 
2014 using potential theory. And more recently, uh, Gardner and Kavishon ca had collaborated to show that if you replace the triangle with a, a, a disk center at a, a point on the unit circle, the image is going to be everything except at most one point. So it's a Picard type of property. Um, so they have very, very chaotic boundary behavior. Of course, what we are going to do today, we are going to, to see that instead of uh, studying uh, Taylor approximants, we will study optimal polynomial approximants. So Tn will be uh, the optimal polynomial approximants. Not of functions, but of reciprocals of certain functions of reciprocals of functions belonging to the Hardy space, to the Dirichlet space, to in general, a category of space. And what will be E for us from now on, it will be just a subset of the unit uh, circle. So all this thing, I had this before I go to Florida uh, to do my postdoc with Catherine uh, Beneteau, that was my background. That's what I, I didn't know anything about optimal approximants. Optimal approximants were introduced by Catherine Beneteau, Daniel Seco, uh, Alan Sola, uh, and their collaborators. Uh, and the last, the last five, eight years, they, they have, it, there is a lot of progress on this. However, in the last slide about universal Taylor series, I would like to capture the philosophy uh, of this talk. So as I said, if my set E, where I have the universality is large, then I have a very wild boundary behavior. So they, in recent years, they try to do the opposite. So if the set E in the unit circle, where I have universal approximation is quite small, then I am allowed to find universal functions that they belong to some good function spaces on the disk. So I write here, um, in this, so I know Merrick is from Florida, so he probably knows, of course, he's from Florida. So that's why I, I write here the, the boundary behavior and I rank it for very smooth. I use amenities, the Floridian amenities, to very wild, uh, using, of course, the alligators. M my biggest fear doing the postdoc in Florida was that I was bitten uh, by uh, an alligator. Uh, and here in the second column, I have function spaces of holomorphic functions on the unit disk. So the largest, of course, space you can imagine is that you don't put any extra assumption. You just take all holomorphic functions in the unit disk. The natural topology to consider there is functions uh, which uh, are holomorphic. So the convergence is the local uniform convergence. So you want to approximate on compact subsets of the unit disk. That's the natural topology we have here. And of course, a very, very small space, because it's very rare, is to have holomorphic functions on the unit disk that can be extended uh, holomorphically to a, a larger disk. So that's a quite small space. Uh, and then the third column here, I have what type of subset, of subset is E, where we can have universality. So if you don't assume anything else, you can have universality on any proper subset of the unit, uh, of the unit uh, circle. So no matter how big it is, I can approximate on any arc. We know this from the theory. Of course, if I have holomorphic function in a strictly uh, greater uh, disk, I can approximate anywhere in the boundary because my function will have to converge to F to itself. The, the Taylor approximants have to uh, converge to itself. So the question is what happens in between? So here I'm gonna include some other function spaces, which we know, and one is contained in the other. A and then I will start with the corresponding st sets where we, it's possible to have universality. So let's start from, uh, from here. Uh, the second space is functions which are holomorphic on the disk and they can continuously extend on the closed unit disk. This is the space is called usually the algebra of the disk, the disk algebra. 
So in that case, uh, in general, it is open. We haven't characterized, but there are some partial results. So when E is finite, we're able to find universal functions that uh, do this, that, that, that uh, have this property. Now, if we take a, uh, another, um, another function space, I want here to say that uh, here, these uh, two spaces, it's not correct to say that one is included in the other or vice versa. So they intersect non-trivially. Um, so this is the Dirichlet space. The Dirichlet space that we will see to, today is the space of uh, functions uh, who send the unit disk uh, to a set of finite area counting multiplicities. So, so we'll see this space more uh, in detail. So the set that I can have universality there, uh, the condition is it has to have a logarithmic capacity zero. Uh, another space, uh, so that's correct what I'm gonna say, a, a, a quite larger space than the Dirichlet space is the Hardy space. So in the Hardy space, uh, I have the property that my functions have non-tangential limits almost everywhere. So what I have on triangles, when I approximate on triangles for almost every vertex, the, the limit exists. So th these are the hardy spaces. Uh, and in that case, it only makes sense to require universality only on sets of measure zero, because otherwise, again, the limits would exist. I would have uh, extension. So it's a recent result due to Bayes and Miller. So they prove that once you have a zero arc length measure, you can have universal Taylor series. And the bigger space is the Bergman space. Uh, so these are all uh, holomorphic functions which are square area integrable. And here there is a condition with finite entropy. I'm not gonna write it, it's, it's quite technical. Anyway, that are the three known cases. But let's go back, well, let's go to the introduction to optimal approximants. Uh, I'm gonna just give a little bit uh, more time to these th three spaces that we show, these three classical spaces. Uh, so the first of all, it's the Bergman space. So what I said, it's square integrable functions with respect to the area measure on the disk. So it's, it's easy to write down a formula. Then we have the Hardy space, H2, uh, so this is, all holomorphic functions, uh, which satisfy a certain growth condition. So what I write here, so this one over two pi, the integral of modulus of f r e to the i theta squared is an increasing function with respect to r. So where, when r tends to one, I want this thing to be finite. So this is a certain growth condition. So if you uh, apply Parseval's uh, inequality, you will see uh, that you have this uh, equality where an are the Taylor coefficients of the, the, fu the function on the hard space. This is because of Parseval's and it's very specific to the index two. Um, and then we have the Dirichlet space, which consists of all functions which have, as I said, finite, which send the unit disk to a set of finite uh, area, uh, counting multiplicities. So we have this condition, it's like in the Bergman, but instead of uh, F, we take the derivative. So in other words, F prime belongs to the Bergman space. Th that's what my condition says. So it's not hard to see that these are spaces are nested. One is included in the other. So if you start with A of D is the largest, then H2, then D. So of course the question is what is in between? And that's the philosophy of the Dirichlet type spaces that we will see now. So they, they belong to a broader family called Dirichlet type spaces, DA. Uh, and I write uh, the definition, which the motivation comes from this Parseval's inequality that I mentioned. So imagine for a moment that we have the Hardy space. So the Hardy space is a space of all holomorphic functions on the unit disk with the property that if you take uh, this series of 
the squares of the moduli of their Taylor coefficients is uh, summable. Uh, so in Dirichlet type space, all you do is just you put a weight here. So instead of having um, alpha being zero, uh, so in the hard case, I had alpha being zero. Uh, so you, you can define the set of all functions whose Taylor coefficients have the property that uh, the series of k plus one, the power of a times uh, modulus of a k squared is summable. Uh, so it's not hard to see that for, for a, for, sorry, a and alpha for me as a Greek person is the same letter, okay? You have to know this makes my life zeta is z and so on. It's, it's the hardest thing being a Greek mathematician. So for a equals one, uh, one can check that you could uh, obtain uh, the Dirichlet space and for alpha equals minus one, you get the Bergman space. So what I see, so for example, the property that I mentioned before, that if you take the derivative of the, um, uh, so before I mentioned that this condition about the Dirichlet space means that the, the function, the derivative of the function belong in A2, it's easy to see this with this formula as well, because you make a shift in the Taylor uh, series when you take the derivatives. So in general, this nested spaces uh, have this property that if you take the derivative, you go to uh, by two alpha, you move by two alpha in, in the other space. I mean, this is a, an easy homework exercise. What is important now that we can also uh, introduce the natural uh, inner product. So the, the inner product is introduced in the obvious way. So the same, you take the same weight and then you multiply the Taylor coefficient of the first with the conjugate of the Taylor coefficient of the second one. So when you have an inner product, uh, you, you are on a Hilbert space. But the good thing is that not only they are uh, Hilbert spaces, but they are reproducing kernel Hil Hilbert spaces. So the reproducing kernels are some functions which help us generate all other functions on the space. Now, let's see the motivation for introducing optimal polynomial approximants. Uh, so it's an introduction to the introduction to optimal approximants. This comes from the concept of cyclicity. So the, I talk about hypercyclicity. Here we have something else, but connected philosophically. So what I do, I am going to say that the function in my Dirichlet type space is cyclic in my space. If and only if I take f, I multiply it by monomials. I take the linear span of it. And then I take all limits. And by this, I want to approximate everything in my space. So in particular, I want to be able to approximate the unity because one is always in my Dirichlet type space, the function that is identically one. So when I approximate the function one by the linear span of monomials, it's like approximating by polynomials, right? So it is equivalent saying that the function f is cyclic or cyclic, uh, if I can find a sequence of polynomials, Pn, with the property that Pn f minus one converts in my norm, uh, in my norm in my Dirichlet type space to zero. It's, it's an obvious co consequence of the definition. So from this, I would like to mention that always when we have convergence with respect to this norm, it all, we always have convergence uh, with respect, we always have point-wise convergence. So in particular, uh, no, in particular, in fact, we have local uniform uh, convergence on the disk. But anyway, we have point-wise convergence. And since we can approximate one by Pn times F, as you can imagine, F cannot have any zeros because if it had zeros, you wouldn't be able to approximate one by Pn times F. So that's a, a very obvious remark. So cyclic functions, if we look for cyclic functions, my functions have to be zero-free. Is this enough? Well, 
for the hard space, we know due to Berling that the cyclic functions are exactly the outer functions. Uh, is there any question? Or just uh, someone activate the mic? Okay. So, so uh, outer functions are functions uh, in the hard space that have the property that they satisfy a certain mean value property on the, on the unit circle about the logarithm. Anyway, we will not really, we will use it, but uh, I don't want to introduce now definitions and so on. Just keep in mind that cyclicity, it's resolved in uh, the Hardy case. So in the Berman case, it's more complicated, but the most interesting thing is what happens in the Dirichlet space. Uh, so Brown and Shields show that if you have a function which is cyclic on the space, of course it has to be outer because the Dirichlet space is smaller than the Hardy space. So it would have to be cyclic also in the Hardy space, so it has to be outer. And an extra condition, so if you consider the radial boundary zeros. So if you take the radial limits of F uh, and they, these radial limits are zero. So that this is the, the boundary zero. Uh, so this set has to have logarithmic capacity zero. It has to be a polar set as we say in, in potential theory. So it has to be small. So it might, you might be able to have zeros on the boundary, but these zeros have to be very, very, uh, it, the set of zeros has to be very small. And one of the biggest uh, problems that remain open in the area, known as the brown Shields conjecture, is if you have also the opposite situation. So we know partial results about this. Uh, Ransford, for example, has some partial results. Um, but still the general case uh, is open. And that's exactly what gave rise to optimal polynomial approximants. Uh, we want to introduce a concept that will, that will uh, give us a full characterization of cyclic functions. Uh, this object uh, is called optimal polynomial approximants. And since I am from Greece, I just noticed that this is OPA. Um, and I know in Florida, probably Merrick will know there is, have you been to Acropolis, Merrick? There is a Greek restaurant in Florida that they break plates, the, the, you know, you go to eat and then they break plates. I have not. But... No, you have to, you have oh, to. It's, uh, they say open and break the plate, you have to experience that. Uh, so what we will do now, we will introduce uh, optimal approximants. Apologies for Chris and uh, Meredith, they're super experts on, on the field. Uh, so we consider the space Pn of all polynomials of degree less or equal than n. So this is a finite, finitely dimensional space. So it has finite dimension. We will say that the polynomial Pn, small, it's an optimal polynomial approximant of order n to one over f. Again, f belongs in my Dirichlet type space. If Pn minimizes the norm Pn f minus one, the norm in my space, among all polynomials in this space of polynomials of degree less or equal than n. So if you see here, I drew the function one, it's very rare that the function one will belong to uh, the space f times Pn. So this, this is the space of functions uh, of my function f, which is a fixed function times pn times, let's say times p, where p belongs in pn, right? So this is again, a finitely dimensional space. So now we are in a Hilbert space. So we have projections. And uh, what we can observe is that pn f minus one, this nor, it's nothing but the distance of the vector one from this uh, space uh, f times pn. It's just because we have projections in the Hilbert space. So pn f, in other words, is the orthogonal projection of one onto the subspace f times pn f. So 
this is important that because it tells us that always opas exist. And in fact, if you don't select f to be the zero function, they will have to be also unique. So they, they exist. So f will never be the identically zero function. So opas always exist and they are unique. So we're, we have a uniquely determined family of opas. Now, uh, it's not, of course, someone would think, oh, let's take the Taylor polynomials of one over F. So I can give you some homework because that's what we give to, to students. Uh, so compute the optimal approximants to one over F for F of Z, one minus Z, uh, and the space, the alpha, to be the, the, the hardest space. So basically what you have to do, you have to write one. So actually show that you don't, it's easy to see that it, these uh, are not the, op, uh, the Taylor approximants of one over F. Uh, because if you take one over F, it's a function one over one minus Z. You know how to write the Taylor sums. So if you compute the norm of PNF minus one, you will get something like uh, the norm of Z to a power, which doesn't go to zero. But that's how you, uh, so one minus Z is a cyclic function uh, there. What, what I want to say that with optimal polynomial approximants, it's not trivial to compute. Even if my function is very simple, it's not trivial to compute. Uh, and unlike the Taylor series, uh, in the Taylor series, you have a function and then it's easy to compute all the coefficients uh, in terms of the functions. Here, it's much more complicated uh, and it's not... Um, so, so in Taylor series, you have, for example, the constant term will appear in the all optimal approximants and it's going to be the same. In opti in, in, sorry, on all, on all Taylor approximants and it's going to be the same. Uh, so you just add some extra terms. In optimal polynomial ap approximants, when you move from the nth to nth plus one, the constant coefficients and in general, the coefficient change. So this is an extra difficulty. So what I'm gonna say now, as I said, the motivation was the concept of cyclicity. Uh, it is natural that we cannot compute optimal polynomial approximants because they, they fully resolve a very difficult problem, uh, namely the one of characterization of cyclicity. So from now on, this is one of the few definitions or notations that you need to remember. By Qn of one over f, it's gonna be the nth optimal approximant to one over f. So we have the following characterization. F is cyclic in my sp space dA, if and only if, Remember, before we said there is a polynomial of degree less or equal than n such that if I multiply it by f and subtract one, it converges to zero in my norm. So here we have a specific optimal polynomial approximant that does the job. Uh, it's the optimal approximant. Uh, and this is equivalent that you have local uniform convergence on the disk. So uniform on compact sets on the disk. And it's equivalent that you have, um, that you have point-wise convergence only taking what happens at zero. Uh, one question for you is what happens about this? So if we knew For a specific, uh, let's call it Z naught. So it's a specific Z naught different than zero. Is it true that F is cyclic? This is something that I don't know if it's true. We know the other direction. I mean, the other direction of course follows from this. Three implies one. Um, but in general, we don't know what happens uh, there. So that's how they connect with cyclicity. 
And usually when I, I talk about optimal approximants, there are some people in the audience that they, they make a very nice observation. Here, you see, I have alpha, alpha, which is fixed. But in statements three and four, alpha does not appear. So what's wrong? I give this question for the audience. So someone who doesn't know about optimal approximant, where is alpha in three and four? The, the inner product that you're using depends on alpha. So excellent. We have a different optimal approximation. Excellent. That's exactly where it is uh, hidden. So this definition of QN really depends on alpha. And I mean, the difficult part, of course, is to prove that this implies this. So four implies two, because the other are kind of obvious. It follows because uh, this norm convergence is stronger than po point-wise and local uniform convergence. So these are kind of obvious. And this follows uh, from the definition. But why four implies two? All you need to do is just uh, have this trick here, Q uh, N of one over F times F minus one a square it and express it as an inner product. I'm not writing it like that as, as an inner product of itself, plus apply uh, Pythagoras theorem. And that's how you connect this with this type of quantity. So you connect this with QN one over F of zero times F of zero minus one. So if you do the calculations, you will get that this norm here is in fact this, I guess with a minus always, I, I confuse. Anyway, I'm not gonna give more details. I just want to say this is something like an observation is, is, is doable to do. So it's quite natural that optimal approximants are a pain to compute uh, because they would solve the brown shields conjecture, but at least studying them has a merit. Uh, so, I would like here to make a commercial break uh, and uh, uh, tell you that Catherine Beneteau and Ray uh, Cent Center from University of Florida, they recently posted in archive a survey about optimal polynomial approximants. And what I said before that optimal approximants were introduced uh, in recent years, in fact, uh, they were introduced in this survey independently around, I think, um, 1970s or 80s uh, for digital, uh, in connection to digital uh, filtering. So they were introduced by applied mathematicians. Um, and there are many type of questions that still remain open. We know some things about their zeros. So in case you want a very proper introduction to the subject, I uh, highly recommend you this. Now, what is the focus? Our focus, as I said previously, it's gonna be the behavior on the unit circle, the behavior of the optimal approximants on the unit circle. Just a few minutes before my talk, I realized that otter means a, a word. I didn't know that. I just suspected because I saw an animal. So I said, let's Google it. And then I found it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. So that's why I, I, I searched about uh, otters. So the, the question as before is just to see what happens in the unit circle? Do we have smooth or wild boundary behavior? So let's see some known cases. Um, so from now on, we will focus on the Hardy uh, space. Uh, so in the Hardy space, we have inner and outer functions. We have this type of factorization. So inner and outer functions are the building blocks of functions in Hardy spaces. So a function f, it's gonna be inner uh, if it is bounded, and uh, its radial limits are unimodular for almost every uh, point on the circle. So if f is inner, then the optimal polynomial approximants are gonna be constants. That's the first case. Now, if f is holomorphic, and uh, not only holomorphic, but also zero free, not on the unit disk, but in a slightly larger disk, uh, then, for every function, uh, for every zeta in the unit circle, we have 
that the optimal polynomial approximant of one over F converts to one over F. So this is a property that happens for cyclic functions. Uh, so always when we have such functions will be cyclic uh, and this will, will happen. And now with Daniel Seco and uh, Catherine Benetto, uh, we published some results uh, recently uh, about the special case where F is a polynomial with simple roots, all of which lie outside uh, the disk, outside the unit uh, disk. So then this QN of one over F approximates one over F, and this happens uniformly on the closed unit disk except the finitely many zeros of f. So it happens, so if I, if I delete some uh, neighborhood of my zeros, I have uniform convergence that reaches uh, the closed unit disk. In fact, this sequence, qn of one over f times f minus one, if you take it, is uniformly bounded on the whole closed uh, disk. For this, we needed to apply some recurrence formulas and um, apply this type of strategy. Uh, however, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm interested in the opposite phenomenon. I'm interested in the wild uh, type of behavior. Uh, so, so far, all these three examples I show, they have a, a, a similarity that the set qn of one over f, this orbits, if you like, at zeta, uh, for every zeta in the unit circle, they have only one limit point. And I'm asking, is always the case. And what happens here, uh, as we will see, it is possible to find functions in the hard space that this set of orbits Qn of one over f at zeta is dense, which actually it's this universality uh, concept I talked in the beginning. So it is possible to find this uh, a function that makes this uh, optimal approximants not only not to converge somewhere, but to converge to everywhere. But of course, uh, what uh, so this is our main result, just uh, as I said, it's an introduction to the subject. So the main results and the few, uh, I think I have three more minutes, just uh, so the, 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 our main result is the following. So you, you fix a set on the unit circle, let's call the set E, uh, and it has R length measure zero. So it's quite a small set. So what I'm saying is the set of all functions in the hard space, except the zero function, of course, uh, that have the property that any function G continues on E, I can find some subsequence of optimal approximants of one over my function, which converges uh, uniformly in G, so uniformly in Z means in the topology of C of V, continuous function. This set not only is not empty, but in fact is a G delta dense set. So most functions for, uh, in the hard space have this property. Their optimal approximants behave quite chaotically. They approximate everything uh, on sets of measure zero in the unit circle. And of course, this assumption on me can not be dispensed with. So it's, it's an essential uh, function. Uh, so I'm gonna just mention some corollaries just to uh, close. So here, um, the, the, the extra thing that we can get is that we can find a function uh, which is universal in this sense, universal optimal approximate and uh, it's also cyclic. So in this case, we have that the optimal approximants of one over F converts to one over F inside the disk. And at the same time on the boundary of a fixed, on a fixed set E, they converge to everywhere. They, 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 they are dense, they are, they are very chaotic. So there is this type of dichotomy. And moreover, what we can say is that uh, if uh, Zn is a, um, 
a, a Blaske sequence. So if you have Zn accumulating to the boundary with a specific rate, so this specific rate uh, depends on this Blaske condition, then I can find a function which has universal optimal approximant and having zeros exactly at these points uh, Zn. Uh, so this, so probably I will omit the proofs, but I will just mention that the key fact for this is that we have a kind of factorization result. Uh, so when I'm interested in computing the optimal approximants of one over an inner function times f, I can, uh, this is just uh, the value at zero conjugate times the optimal approximant of one over f which actually tells us that F uh, is universal, has universal optimal approximants if and only if I multiplied with any inner function uh, with, okay, G of zero different than zero, uh, and it's still a uh, universal uh, optimal approximant. So just to uh, conclude, so I'm not gonna, um, I don't have time to explain the proof. I can, if somebody asks, I can do. So what is behind the proof? Very quickly, I'm going to say that behind the proof is Bear's category theorem. So we take our set, we write it as countable intersection of a certain countable uni unions. And all we need to prove is that these sets here, so these sets here are the sets of all functions in the hardy space, which approximate, which approximants, approximate a fixed polynomial with coefficients in uh, which are rational. We do this in order to have a countable exhaustion. Uh, and they approximate it by a fixed constant. So if we prove that this set is open in H2, and we prove that the, the union is dense in H2, we have a countable intersection of open dense sets and Bear's category theorem automatically gives you that this is gonna be dense. So that was the whole philosophy. And what is behind this? Uh, so what is behind this uh, proof? Uh, so the first one, it just shows that the, the operator of operator, the mapping, sending an f to the nth optimal approximants of one over f restricted on the set that I have an approximation is continuous, which was not hard to prove. Uh, it's just um, playing a little bit with the structure of optimal approximants. But th this proof works for um, a certain category of spaces. What was the hardest one was proposition two that this uh, union that I wrote is dense. And the, my last uh, slide um, that I would like to say is that behind this proof, we had to find a simultaneous zero free approximation. Previously, I mentioned the corresponding result for Taylor series, which, which was due to Bison and Miller. So they provided a simultaneous polynomial approximation there. Uh, and we were trying to imitate their method. However, they use han banach theorem. They use the fact that you have a function space. So when you deal with uh, one over f, these are not linear. This is a highly nonlinear operator, this qn. So you cannot play with functional analysis. So what we had to do uh, is to obtain a zero free, uh, a zero free simultaneous approximation result. So what it, it says that it's give me any function uh, continuous on a set of measure zero on the unit circle. Let's call it G. And give me any function F in H2, which again is zero free on the disk. I want to be able to find a polynomial which is zero free on the closed disk. That's what it is important. And can approximate simultaneously and F in my hard space and Z in the space of continuous function on me. So this, this we had to construct it and this was as essentially the most difficult part of the proof. So my talk is essentially over just to say before I say thank you that we have a corresponding result uh, about the Dirichlet space. 
The difference is that here we have logarithmic capacity zero. And what remains open is what happens in the Bergman case. And also what remains open is what can we say if E is not a subset of the unit circle, but E could be also outside the unit circle. So that's uh, all I have to say. So thank you very much for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you.